Fun. So we've wrapped up our purpose series for those of you who've been here for the last six weeks, and we are ready to start and launch a new series. And this series will be feasting with Jesus. We'll be sitting down at the banquet table with him. We'll be having some meals with him and learning about Jesus. We're following, also Sion Bombella is doing a similar series on feasting with Jesus. And so in this series, we'll be looking at some meals that Jesus had with various people, and we'll be learning more about him through these meals as we feast with him. We'll explore what these meals reveal to him about his heart, his action, his mission, his values. And the first one that we'll be feasting on today is the wedding at Cana. And that's what we'll look at today. So let us just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can meet here today freely to chew on your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd be in this place. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just speak through me. Say the words that you want us all to hear, Lord Jesus. Pray that you'd give us soft hearts, open ears, open minds to hear from you. May we learn more about our beautiful Savior as we feast with him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's open up our Bibles to where we find this beautiful wedding in Cana. We find it in John chapter 2. So open up your Bibles to John chapter 2. It is also on the screen. We'll start with verse 1. We're going 1 through 11. Are you there? Everyone's there fast. Okay, great. All right, let's read. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So as we read this account, let's look at what we learn about Jesus. Let's look at his actions, his heart, his values, and his mission. So let's first look at his actions. What actions is Jesus about? What is he doing in this account? First of all, note that Jesus is a man of action. The King James translation makes it easy for us to see what is about to happen. The heading of this section is Miracle at Cana. So we don't even need to read the text to know, okay, we are about to read about a miracle. And what's special about this miracle is it is the first of Jesus' miracles. So for us, it's really on full display that Jesus is about doing miracles. He is about doing He's a God of action. He doesn't just sit up in his throne in heaven, but he comes down and he's in the business of doing. But Jesus doesn't just do. What he does is he turns the ordinary into the extraordinary. Jesus made ordinary water into wine. And not just your typical wine saved for the end of a party when everybody's had plenty to drink, but it's probably the quality of that very first toast that you pour when you introduce the brand new bride and groom 
It's that, it's that wine. It's the best. Did you ever notice that with Jesus, what you put in is not always what you get out? What you get out is way better than what you put in. For example, have you ever woke up in the morning and you just, you go through your day and you, you're thinking about your day that you have ahead of you? Meetings after meetings, maybe tough conversations you have to have, maybe an exam you have to take or a, one you must study for, and you just think there's no way, I don't have a minute to spare. And so you contemplate skipping that quiet time. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I see lots of heads. But then there's that niggle in your heart. Jesus saying, come on, just come, come spend some time with me, even a little bit. And so you do. And so you enter into that time and you start your morning in prayer and you open up the word. And all of a sudden, as you go through your day, your meetings get done quicker. That exam that you took was way better than you thought. Maybe that tough conversation you had to have was actually enjoyable, and there was so much fruit. And you find yourself at the end of the day, even with time to kick up your feet and relax and rest. You see, with Jesus, one plus one isn't always two. Or in this case, two minus one isn't one. In God's economy, you don't actually lose that time. You don't lose minutes of your day. But you gained, as you brought Jesus into your day, he multiplied what you thought you were going to lose. Or maybe you've been prompted by the Holy Spirit to help somebody in need, but you think about that it's that last hundred rand note right before payday is about to come. And you're not sure, this is all you've got until payday. And you think, 100 minus 100, I'm going to have zero for just a couple more days. But you do it anyways, and you obey. And I know there are people in this very room right now who've done that. And I hear stories of how you did it, and then, all of a sudden, there's 200 rand sitting in your Bible. Somebody slipped in there. Or you find some money in your jacket pocket. Or maybe somebody is offered to pay for your groceries. And that 100 minus 100 is no longer zero but it's 200, or maybe sometimes it's become 500. Jesus is in the business of filling our empty spaces. He's filling our water jugs. He multiplies what we have. He is about turning the ordinary into extraordinary. The servants put in ordin the ordinary, they put in water, but what they got out was the choice as it says, the best wine. And so it is with us, even in the everyday things of life. When we invite Jesus to be part of it, it can be turned into extraordinary. And let's look at what this account tells us about Jesus' values. What's important to Jesus? What are his attitudes? When we have our Sanani team time, we invite our care workers to come. And we often just reflect on what values are important to be caring for the most vulnerable. So we, we say to them, okay, I'll give a, we'll give a scenario about a child in need. We'll kind of make up a story, maybe pick some different elements from our different children in our communities. This one, we've got a vulnerable child here. She's living with Gogo, but that Gogo abuses her. And we ask the care workers, okay, what values. And we also say, okay, let's give her a name. What's our child's name? And this last time they said her name was Boothley. So we say, okay, what values does Boothley's care worker need in order to care well for her? And these are the, care work, the, the ones that the care workers came up with this time. Every year we get a different list, but they usually look very similar to this. But we see these are our values that Jesus has, aren't they? So let's take a look at what values specifically do we see in this story that are on full display in the story of the wedding at Cana. One can't help but notice Jesus' patience. 
His mother comes to tell him that the wine has run out, and he says, okay, why are you involving me? And I just think, okay, if he was a teenager or maybe even one of us, <laughs> I just can hear the tone. Yeah, and? What do you want me to do about it? Okay, I'm not the master of this banquet. But I see such patience in Jesus. Even though he said, if my hour has not come, he still did something. He didn't say, it's not my job. And it just makes me think about Jesus' patience with me. How many times did he knock on the door of my heart before I answered him? And I'm so thankful that he had patience with me. It wasn't just once and he left. How many times have we messed up and we've come back and asked him to forgive us? And he does time and time again. Or maybe he's actually called us to do something and we haven't yet obeyed. Maybe he's asked us, go visit that widow next door. Maybe he's asked us to help somebody in need. Or maybe to share the gospel with a family member and we don't. Yet he's patient and he continues to speak with us until we get on his right path. Let's just take a moment and think about when the Lord had to tell you more than once to do something or not to do something, and yet he remained patient with us. Let's just pause for a moment. Second Peter 3 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. I couldn't help but just pause and thank the Lord for his patience with me as I read this account. Thank him that he gives us multiple chances to get it right. Jesus is also empathetic in this story. We see his empathy, which is his ability to feel what other people are feeling. He seems to feel for the situation, doesn't he? Years ago, I was asked by my neighbor, to be a bridesmaid in her wedding. And my neighbor was our kid's babysitter. And so I stood age-wise about halfway between her and her mom. And so being about 12 years older than the rest of the bridesmaids, I thought, you know what, rather, why don't I be your personal attendant? We'll let your young ladies be the bridesmaids. And I don't know if we know what a personal attendant here, but back home, in America, a personal attendant, it's not a planner, it's not the wedding planner, it's not the one that just helps you decide the decor or the food. It's just simply a person designated for the day of the wedding to answer any questions that anyone may have, from the kitchen staff to the DJ, anything like that, really just to shield the bride and groom from those logistical things so they can just focus on their day. And so, unfortunately, for this family that I was the personal attendant for, they didn't have a huge budget. So they made a plan for heavy appetizers as the meal. Not appetizers, <laughs> but starters. Heavy starters for the meal. And I've seen this done very well at many weddings, so long as there are plenty of portions to go around. But at this wedding, unfortunately, the food ran out very quickly. In fact, there were some people who didn't even get one portion. So obviously, I don't have to even say it was embarrassing for the family. And unfortunately, the kitchen staff knew I was the person to take all those questions. <laughs> but of course, I had no answers. There wasn't money to, be, to say, oh, just cook some more food. I knew the family couldn't afford it. And yet there were guests who hadn't received even one morsel. So needless to say, it was embarrassing for the family. And sadly, when I look back on that wedding and I remember it, even though my daughter was the flower girl in the wedding and my son the ring bearer, what I remember is that chaos about people being hungry and complaining and thinking about where they were going to go after they left the wedding. I wished 
there was something I could do for them. So when I read this story, I kind of understand what the, what the wedding banquet, the ceremonies, um, the master of the ceremony was thinking. In Jesus' days, things weren't very different in that aspect. In his days, running out of wine could tarnish a family's reputation. But Jesus displays his empathetic and his caring ways. He cared for this family. You see, Jesus doesn't just care for our basic needs. He cares for our reputation. He cares for our standing among the people. And not so that we can puff up our chests and be prideful, but in a way that gives honor and glory to him. I think sometimes we forget about this. Have we ever felt there's something too trivial to pray for? Maybe you're about to leave a job and start a new job, and you're struggling because maybe it's a difficult place to work and you can't wait till you leave. But you know Jesus even cares about how you leave that place. He wants you to leave in peace. And it, even that is something to be praying about. I think sometimes we think those things are too trivial to pray for because we think Jesus is just in the business of maybe healing sickness or restoring marriage or feeding hungry tummies. But this story shows us that Jesus is also, he cares about even some things that may seem trivial to us, like wine at the end of a banquet. He saved face for this family. He allowed the wedding day to be remembered as a special, lavish occasion. He prevented the family's reputation from being tarnished, and perhaps it was even talked about for years. Hey, remember that wedding we went to in Cana? Yo, when they brought out the best wine at the end of the night? What a lavish banquet. Which also speaks to his generosity. He loves to lavish his children with good gifts. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Matthew 7.11 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to him who asks? Jesus didn't just give them the cheap wine. He gave them the best wine. And I love how in verse 10 it says, everyone brings out the choice wine at first and the cheaper wine when the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. Isn't that our Jesus? He saves the best for his children. And again, sometimes we sell ourselves short and we forget that he wants to give us his best. He didn't just defend them by giving them some wine to make sure that the people didn't grumble. I bet the master of the ceremonies wasn't the only one to take a sip and say, wow, this is some good wine. I didn't think this family could afford that. It really reminds me of a verse that I shared back on Sanani Sunday. Something that Job said to his friend. He said, if I have kept the poor from their desire. He didn't say if I've kept myself from meeting the needs of the poor. But his goal was a life of delight for the poor. Not just to meet their basic needs. And I believe that this is something that Job learned from our Heavenly Father. That God doesn't just meet our needs. There's many times in life where he just wants to lavish us with good gifts. Things we never thought possible. But I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel, because many times these aren't even material things. So I'm just going to share a, a story with you. Years ago, Craig was asked to stand up in one of his friend's weddings. And it was across the country, so we were living in a state called Wisconsin. 
We had to fly to California, and it happened to be on our wedding anniversary weekend as well. So we went to the wedding, and we had a great time, and the ceremony and the reception was on Saturday. And everybody, everyone had traveled into this, this wedding. And on Sunday, everybody left. But we had stayed on an extra day because we wanted to celebrate our anniversary. What better place to celebrate it than this beautiful, pristine lake in Lake Arrowhead, California. We'd never been there before. It was a beautiful setting. The lodge was right on this lake. The tall redwoods of California were there. There were beautiful homes on this lake, and there wasn't anyone in sight. Everyone had closed up their... These were mostly second homes, so they had been closed up for the winter. And Craig and I, we love water, and we love to boat. And so we just stood on the pier and just soaked in, enjoying this beautiful lake, and looked at each other and said, wouldn't it be cool if we could get a boat ride on this lake? But there wasn't a boat in sight, not one. So we just sat by the water and enjoyed ourselves. So we sat on this pier, and it was a beautiful autumn day. The sun was shining, it was warm, but there was this cool breeze. And so we ended up just laying back on this pier and just feeling the warmth of the sun and this just crisp breeze. And all of a sudden, as right as a, we're about to just fall asleep, you know, in this just beautiful weather, just basking in it, all of a sudden we wake up to the sound and we sit up to find a boat at the end of the pier. And we look up and there's a man driving the boat and he said, do you guys want to ride? <laughs> we, look, we look at each other like, are we awake? Are we asleep? What has just happened here? No other boats on this lake, but it's a man driving a boat, and his son is skiing. And he needed a spotter, because it's illegal, actually, to drive a boat if someone's skiing without a third person as the spotter. He said, we need a spotter. Would you come on the boat with us? Absolutely. So we got on that boat, and he took us for just this exquisite, beautiful ride. He gave us a tour of the lake. He showed us this house belongs to this person and the history of this that happened there. And we still look back at that time. Over 15 or so years ago, we look back and say, wow, that was an anniversary gift from the Lord. He loves to lavish us with good gifts. But what else? What does this story reveal about his heart? Jesus' heart is for us. And I'm often reminded of this when I see kids and um, parents saying, Johnny, don't cross the street, don't touch that. Or maybe we talk to our, chill, our teenagers and say, I don't know about hanging about with, out with those people. And when they don't want to listen, I'm reminded, mm, how many times do we do that to our Heavenly Father? Sometimes the kids listen. Sometimes it's right away, like when they burn their finger on the stove. Sometimes it's not till they're 20 and they send you that message saying, thank you. Thank you that you told me not to hang out with those people. And like we told our kids, don't touch the stove, and don't run in the parking lot, and don't hang out with those people, we didn't do it so that they would miss out on something, do we? Just like we're for our kids, they just don't know it, our Heavenly Father is for us. Sometimes people who don't know Jesus, they think that Christianity is a list of rules that we must obey, but it's not. Jesus doesn't give us a list of rules to get to heaven. The Word says, if we confess with our tongue that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. He doesn't give us a list of to-dos. He does, however, give us a list of some best practices, and he gives us free will. Like, for example, do not be unequally yoked. I've talked to young people about this one, and they, they think it's Jesus is keeping them from their, the person that they want to be with. 
But remember, Jesus is for us. He's simply keeping us from a difficult situation later. As one of my friend's father says, do you want to struggle or do you want joy? Our Heavenly Father wants us to have joy. And that new wine that he puts in those jug even speaks of his joy. So when Mary says to the servants, do whatever he tells you, imagine what they're thinking. We've run out of wine, and now you're telling me to fill up the jugs where we're supposed to wash our hands. What does one have to do with the other? Thinking this Jesus guy, he must be off of his rocker. And then the wine is finished. Why are we getting wine? And then Jesus says, go, take it to the head waiter now. And I imagine they're probably thinking, okay, where am I going to apply for my job this week? I'm about to give the head waiter some water like I can trick him. This guy can't be tricked. But according to this account, they didn't even ask any questions. They just did as Jesus told them. Seems like a lesson every child of God could learn, doesn't it? Just do what he says. Just do it. But often we him and we haw, we try to justify, no, no, but my way's not against the word, my way's not a sin, even though they know that the Lord has told them something else. And sometimes maybe it's not, maybe it's not a sin per se, but maybe Jesus has something better for you. Sometimes we seem to forget that he is for us. So when he tells us his way, it's not so that we can miss out on something awesome. It's usually because he has something better for us. What if the servant said, no, 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 our guests, they don't want water. They want wine. I'll go. Let me run. I know a place. I know a place where I can get some of the cheap stuff. It's the end of the night. It's fine. They won't know the difference. What if they said that? They would have missed out because Jesus had something better for them. He had the best wine. They just needed to trust him. And finally, let's see what this story tells us about Jesus' mission. Jesus came to make a way to heaven for us. He came to bring freedom from religion, to bring us into an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus used the six jars, which were meant for purification. The water was for ceremonial washing before and after a meal. But all the ceremonies, all the rituals, all the sacrifices, they were just simply a shadow of the good things to come, as we learn in Hebrews 10. The law was there to teach us about God's holiness, to help us to see our sin and our need for a Savior. And Jesus is now fulfilling the law through those very purification jars. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus takes those empty jars meant for religion, and he fills them with water to bring forth new wine. New wine which speaks of his death that bought the way for us. The new wine pointed to his blood which washed us from our sins. It's his atoning sacrifice. Jesus was bringing forth the new covenant. In Luke 5, Jesus tells us that the new wine is going to be something different. It cannot mix with the old ways of religion. He said in a parable, no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. In this message, Jesus was declaring that under him, things are going to be different. He is the new wine. 
The new wine also speaks of his spirit. Jesus' new ways of spiritual freedom, they're not going to mix with religious rituals. The new wine at the wedding speaks of a relationship free from religion. Intimate fellowship with Jesus destroys religion. We no longer need the purification jars for our ceremonial cleansing. We enter into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. So what does it mean to be in relationship versus being religious? I remember a story about maybe last year sometime, a family from one of our communities had reached out to our team and there were two teenage girls living in a home and their mom had left to go find work far away. Their father was in prison for abusing them in the past. And so these very vulnerable teenage girls were home alone and they said that someone had tried to break in their house the night before, but they were able to scare them away. And so our team reached out to the person on the ground in that community that we work with and said, please go check on the girls, make sure there's locks, bars on the windows, check and see what we need, if they need anything from us. We need to keep them safe. They're very vulnerable. And so the next day, we followed up to say, okay, what did you find? What do we need to do? And we found out that she was unable to go check on them because she had to get to a prayer meeting. Is that relationship or is that religion? Do we think that Jesus wanted her more at that prayer meeting than to speak up for those children who had no voice? Are we hung up on religion? Or are we to stop, okay to stop and be Jesus to a needy world? Have we ever allowed religion to get in the way of Jesus' mission for the church? If our mission is to bring others to him, are we ever too busy, too caught up in the ceremony of church to reach a lost world? I've had to check myself at times. I often pick up people on the way to church. And there's been times I found myself at the meeting place waiting for the person or the people I'm supposed to bring. And I'm watching the clock and I'm thinking, Yeesh, supposed to be at church before the prayer, before first service. And then I remember, but what is my purpose of going to church? Must I be on time for religion's sake? The purpose of church, the purpose of me being a Christ follower isn't to get to a meeting on time. It's to bring others into that relationship with Jesus so they can be free. So they also can be forgiven for their sins. So they can be built up. So when it's about relationship with my Savior, I don't need to worry about being on time to church if I have a brother or sister in need or that needs to get to church. I know that my Jesus would rather me wait patiently as a way to love my neighbor rather than to just rush off and leave them high and dry. Remember when Guy spoke about the Good Samaritan a couple weeks ago, It was the religious men that walked past the man who'd been robbed, but the Samaritan that stopped and took time to help him. And how do we have this relationship with the Lord? The new wine speaks of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit in us which cries out, Abba, Father. We are his children. We are in relationship with him. And what is the mission of the Holy Spirit? It's to make Jesus Christ known, to glorify him, that people believe in the saving power of his death and resurrection. In Romans 10, 4, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And as we read in John 2, that last verse, it says this, The first of his signs, 
Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So we see that his mission was being fulfilled in this account as his glory was manifested and his disciples believed in him. So as we conclude, let's recap what we learned about Jesus through this wedding in Cana. We see that Jesus is patient, he's caring, he's empathetic, he's generous. We see that his heart is for us. We see that he came to break off religion and bring us into relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we see that he's a man of action. And when we invite Jesus to be a part of what we do, a part of our action, then Jesus can turn our ordinary into the extraordinary. So for me, I love to cook. And cooking can seem very ordinary. We do it every day if we want to fill our tummies, right? And one of my favorite things to do with my kids, our bonus kids, our Sinani kids, when they come over is to cook with them. And I usually say a quick prayer and I invite Jesus into that time into the kitchen, and it's where many of my kids have shared some of their most difficult pains in life. It's where we have chats about their dreams. It's where I can speak his truth into their lives and where I can give them motherly advice for their future. And it really becomes a holy moment. When we invite Jesus into our everyday actions, they can become extraordinary. A few weeks ago, one of our Sanani girls was over for the weekend, and Craig came walking into the kitchen, and he saw me chopping up, and he saw that she wasn't there. He said, hey, where is she? This is where the magic happens. And he's right. Magic as in the extraordinary. It's where Jesus is invited into our actions, and he opens up our hearts. He builds relationships. He brings healing and he brings love, and he grows our love. So in this series, Alan from Siwam Bumbela, who's following this same series, he felt we should give ourselves a challenge through each of these feasts that we'll be having with Jesus. And for this challenge at the wedding in Cana, let's challenge ourselves to have a meal and invite our family and friends over. And just as in Jesus enjoyed this wedding with his family and friends, but when we do, let's not forget to invite Jesus to the meal. Let's not get caught up in the normal, the comfort of being with the people we know, friends and family, that we forget to invite Jesus to the table. Whether your family or friends are believers or unbelievers, It doesn't matter. Jesus is in the action of working miracles. So invite Jesus to your table and see how he turns your ordinary meal into something extraordinary. Let's pray.